Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello, and welcome to episode 14 of the Play Podcast, where we explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. The curtain rises on our play today on a museum that is housed in the reproduction of a slave ship. Two women, Lou and Essie, are looking at a painting by J.M.W. Turner entitled The Slave Ship, although we cannot see the painting as it hangs on the fourth wall of the museum. They describe some of what they see in the painting. A ship in a whirlwind of sea, amber, gold, chrome, the darkest, darkest sea, and a blood-red sky. A typical Turner seascape. Except that if you look closely, you'll pick out in the foreground the dark smudges of paint that represent figures drowning in the tumultuous sea. Look even more closely, and you'll realize that these are the bodies of slaves with irons on their limbs who've been thrown overboard from the ship. The painting is an amazing riot of colour. Lou asks Essie, why does he make something so ugly beautiful? This is the prologue to Winsome Pinnock's powerful new play, Rockets and Blue Lights, which was in preview to open at the Manchester Royal Exchange Theatre in March this year, when the COVID-19 lockdown cruelly closed all of our theatres. Happily, the cast were able to repurpose their performances to broadcast it as a radio play as part of Radio 3's series of plays in lockdown transmitted over the summer. The play also received the 2018 Alfred Fagan Award, which is granted annually for the best new play by a black British playwright of Caribbean or African descent resident in the United Kingdom. I'm sure that as soon as the lights go up again in the theatres around the country, we will see this wonderful play back on the stage. It also particularly apt that we are talking about it during Black History Month, because I'm also certain that this play will be performed, read, and studied for many years to come. So I am especially delighted and honoured to welcome the play's author, Winsome Pinnock, to the podcast today. Winsome joins me from her home in London via the wonders of internet meeting technologies. Hello, Winsome. How are you? Hello, I'm well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me on to your podcast. My pleasure. I'm going to do a proper introduction to you now. Winsome Pinnock is an award-winning British playwright of Jamaican heritage. Her plays include A Hero's Welcome, Talking in Tongues, Mules, Water, and One Under. Her breakthrough play, Leave Taking, which premiered at the Liverpool Playhouse in 1986, has been produced four times since in major UK theatres, including at the National Theatre in London, where in 1994 it was the first play written by a black British woman to have been produced there. It was revived at the Bush in 2018 and still speaks to the immigrant experience of building a life in a new country while carrying the culture of where they came from. Winsome has been a visiting fellow at Cambridge University and a writer in residence at Holloway Prison, Clean Break Theatre Company, the Royal Court, Coomba Arts Community Centre, the Tricycle Theatre, and the Royal National Theatre Studio. So you see, I am honoured. Thank you so much for joining me, Winston. So, there's a note in the preface of the published text of the play that says two of the many inspirations for the play were two paintings by J.M.W. Turner. The first, as I described at the beginning, is known as The Slave Ship. Its original title was Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and the Dying, Typhoon Coming On. Your note in the text says that it is a popular belief that the slave ship portrays the Zong Massacre, which took place when Turner was a child, but some think it tells another story. So first, I wonder if you could tell us what was the Zong Massacre and why was this painting an inspiration to you? Well, the Zong Massacre took place in 1781 when a slave ship transporting enslaved African people to Jamaica suffered a shortage of water and they ended up throwing overboard a number of the enslaved people, over a hundred of them, 130 or more, into the sea and then proceeded to claim on the insurance because they'd insured these people as cargo. At first I think there was a court case that was found in their favour and then this was challenged 
by Lord Mansfield, who was involved in two significant court cases involving enslavement. And the appeal was successful. And I, I'm not sure what happened after that. I think it was one of these unresolved cases, but it was apparently, or many people thought that it was the inspiration for Turner's famous painting, The Slave Ship, which unfortunately isn't in this country. It's one of his paintings that really should be in this country so that people could view it, but it is in Boston at the Museum of Modern Art. And this painting was really interesting to me for many, many reasons. I think it's very much, it's meant to be part of the art created during the period of abolition, but it feels very different to other kinds of art created at that time. For one, it's because a lot of work is quite, well, you could use the word worthy, and this really isn't. This is full of passion and extreme sort of, as, as I mentioned in the prologue of the play, beauty, uh, you know, the sort of the clash of beauty and terror in this painting, but also the fact that it seemed to be of its time and yet not of its time. It seemed very much a painting that was pointing towards the future. I found a really interesting essay where I came across this idea that it wasn't about the song. And this essay suggested that the painting was really about the ongoing legacy of enslavement, of the slave trade. Because what used to happen was that when the slave trade became illegal, it continued. And so the Royal Navy used to pursue the ships, send up flares to tell them they were pursuing them. Some people think they sent up the flares to warn them so that they could get rid of the cargo. So they would throw these people overboard so that they wouldn't be caught in this illegal trade. And so this idea of the legacy of the slave trade was really interesting to me because, you know, today we talk about racism and now we talk about it a lot. And that is one of the enduring legacies. There are very many more of that time. Yeah, so I, it's fascinating to say about the painting is it's very beautiful and has this classic Turner seascape. And actually, originally the title was Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead. I don't, you don't really see that. It's, their yeah. figures are lost in the sea. So yeah. it's a strange way that it's emblematic because it's sort of not as direct as you might imagine. And actually I read somewhere something very interesting where they said about the painting that the act is, oh no, it's in your play. You're saying that the act is done. So it is incumbent upon us to contemplate the consequences yeah. rather than actually witnessing the suffering at the time so directly. And that, I think, speaks to what you're saying about legacy and that the painting provokes that thinking. I was interested in the title of the play as well, which is a beautiful title. It sounds beautiful, again, like the painting, and it sounds like it's possibly celebratory, but it, it actually refers to the second Turner painting, that you cited in the preface, which is called Rockets and Blue Lights. But the subject of that painting is not the slave trade, I don't think. But you mentioned that the Navy sends up rockets or something to warn. Is that where the title comes from? Yeah, I, I just used his title. I loved that painting. It has, as is explained in the play, this incredible blue, um, which is the light of the flare, I, I suppose. But there is something about that. And the fact is that they were painted in the same year. They were both created in 1840. So that was interesting to me that he created one with such a dark aspect and the other which has this incredible light in it. And it did seem apt to me that it, because it was about, you know, this painting depicted flares going up and the slavers showed people being thrown overboard when pursued. So I was, yeah, the, I made the link between the two. I appropriated that second painting. Oh, I was going to say, it's really resonant, uh, I think, because this combination of the colours, as well as you saying, the blood red of the sunset in the slave ship and the bright blue of the sky in rockets, or is, is the blue maybe a colour of hope of some kind against the red that's the tragedy of the, of the slave ship painting? For listeners who haven't seen or heard or read the play yet, Winsome, 
Would you be able to give us a brief summary of the overall plot or introduce us to some of the key characters? I know this isn't going to be easy because this play is so rich in characters, stories, and themes. But if you get started, we can help the listeners to understand a bit about what the play is about. Yeah, it does have quite a complicated structure uh, because it uses multiple time frames. But I suppose for me, in many ways, the central focus of the play, apart from Turner creating his work, traveling, engaging with the ships and slave ships, etc., you know, in, in various ways, the central focus is an actress, a black actress, a black performer, contemporary, you know, modern day actor who is performing in a film of Turner's painting, The Zong. So this idea that it is the slave ship is the Zong massacre. And it's really, in a way, about what happens to her as she researches and rehearses this film, which brings history alive for her. It makes it present for her so that there's a kind of haunting that happens. She's kind of haunted by the legacy of the slave trade. But there is also the sense that she also is haunting the past, which is a peculiar idea, but one that I liked very much. And, you know, that's something that becomes possible only in theatre, where you can collapse the boundaries of time and space. Yes, the play actually, as you said, involves different time periods. So there is yeah. Lou, the actress from the modern day in 2006 seven, which happens to be the bicentenary of the legislation to abolish the slave trade. Yeah. And then there's a, a big part of the play that's set in 1840 and is the story of a slave ship called the Glory, which sails from England to Africa and then from there to transport slaves to Brazil. And as you pointed out at the beginning, this is after the legal abolition of the slave trade, but they are carrying it on in any case. And we're introduced to characters back in 1840 as well. Thomas, who's a black sailor who is leaving his wife to sign on for one last voyage on the glory. His wife, Lucy, who's a former slave. His daughter, Jess, who are left back in England. And as you mentioned, Turner himself appears in the play and joins this ship, which I guess, as you imagine, what his inspiration might have been to make the painting. The ship, however, when it docks in Africa, Thomas is signed up thinking this is just a merchant ship that's trading goods but it surreptitiously is trading as a slave trade and it collects slaves in Africa and in fact captures Thomas himself to be transported across the Atlantic. And at some point in, in that journey, they're hunted down by a Royal Navy ship, like you've described. And again, as in the Zong, Thomas and these slaves are, are thrown overboard. So there's that whole horrible historical story, but it's interwoven with the modern day characters that you've created, and even who appear together on the stage, as you say, that can be done in theaters, somehow mm -hmm. bring the past into the present and vice versa. So the structure is, I think, incredibly clever, connecting the different periods and stories. And the story, of course, of the slave ship is very dramatic and vivid, but it's interesting the way they reflect on each other. It gives us a way to connect to the past and see how it still has an impact on us in the present. I read an article you wrote about something you called hauntology, which suggests that the legacy of the past resonates within or haunts our present day realities. And I guess this is part of what you're intending in terms of the way you structured the play, but how did this idea of the past still present actually come into the play? And, and how do you see the legacy of the past still being manifest in our present world? Well. I was interested in this because I heard the historian James Wolvin talking about the legacy of the slave trade. He, of course, wrote a book called The Zong. He was one of the first historians to actually write about the Zong massacre. He was looking at the legacy of enslavement and the many ways in which it is manifest in our lives today even through things like, <laughs> I, I was interested in what he said about, well, of course, things like racism, of course, diabetes, because of what he described as a sort of addiction to sugar, 
this sort of mania for sugar that was driving the trade, you know, where the enslaved people would work on the plantations, cutting the cane to produce this sugar that people were having this incredible hunger for sugar in various, various products. And that interested me because a lot of people talk about enslavement, especially people who are part of the African diaspora, because often they feel it, they feel that there is this sort of unresolved history that they are terrorised by almost, you know, that this sort of everyday racism that people deal with that has never been confronted, perhaps until this year, properly confronted, you know, symbolically through the dismantling of the statue of Colston in Bristol. And so that, that was one of my starting points. That was one of the things that really interested me And I wanted to show that or somehow dramatize that within the play. Yeah, it's uh, it's, uh, interesting looking back at trying to understand the foundations of why racism institutionally exists is clearly important. But it's also personal, isn't it? It's a I I read somewhere that you said you were you're descended from enslaved people and many people who are children of immigrants from the Caribbean have this sense that history hasn't really been resolved not just in institutional terms, but personally, because you don't really know where you come from. That's right. In very specific terms. Exactly. My, I, I was thinking about this because my f- parents did our family tree. They spent quite a long time doing this. Mm. And I, seven or eight generations in Canada, but came, but they traced it all the way back through the Revolutionary War in America, United Empire loyalists mm. to the crown who were given land in a Canada, but then all the way back to Europe and crossings of from Germany in the 17th century. And, you know, we have the records for that. But people who are descendants of slaves haven't got that same route back through records to where they came from. And I was struck by the television program, Who Do You Think You Are?, which follows genealogy trails for people. And I was struck by the title of that, which is really interesting is who do you think you are? The title itself suggests that your own identity is linked or founded on who your ancestors are and knowing that. Yeah. And so that must be something that you feel deeply that I have the privilege of knowing some of this and you, as you say, it feels unresolved. Yeah, it's unresolved because they weren't compensated for this atrocity. There has been no compensation and there has been no real you know, reckoning in in a way or no acknowledgement of the suffering that that's produced down the centuries. And perhaps this is a moment where people are starting to realise that and that there is some kind of redress coming. I think that the theatre has this potential to go some way to making that kind of reparation. Plays can do it and, and sort of this healing that can happen in the theatre, this way in which people can together share this kind of history. You know, there was this idea of prosthetic memory, that when people watch a play, that what they see becomes part of their own history, actually. It's part of their memory. They can enter into it. And I think I quite like that idea. It's not about appropriating it, but somehow appreciating it and engaging engaging with it so it's it's the power of that experience that emotional experience yeah. where you're invested in in live theater that that's that stays with you yeah. which which is what the power of art can be i yeah. think and but it's even even more so experiential in theater and explicit as well because words are part of it too it's not just a musical or or a visual art experience it's actually um, got more explicit language than that as well that you can keep with you that's really interesting you also talked about how portraying these traumatic events of the past and finding these connections to those lost people those lost voices that have been marginalized in history because the records don't feature them in the same way as in even the painting we we know the painting and the paintings by a very famous white artist and and I guess the records we have, log books of ships and all that kind of stuff, are all written by the white owners That's of right. these ships or yeah. the captains or whoever it is. We don't have the voices of the slaves themselves. So I think you suggested that one of the things about the play was 
and drama and theater can somehow retrieve these voices and tell these stories and make them human and therefore something we can understand. But how do you find those voices? Is that something you were in, you were deliberately intending to do? Yes. And I think it takes a leap of confidence, actually, to do so. I mean, I did do a lot of research. I was reading reports of people who went out to the plantations to observe the life of the plantation and reported on the terrible state of the enslaved people, the terrible conditions that they were living and working in. But even then, of course, their voices aren't heard because they weren't interviewed. They were just described. But the actions that were described are also quite telling. And one of the things that comes out of those reports is just how much people resisted their enslavement. They resisted through, of course, uh, escaping, through suicide, in fact, quite a lot. Some people starved themselves or, of course, there is the account of people throwing themselves over the ship. They would prefer to do that than be captured. And I think the resistance to enslavement was something that I was also very much interested in. So those gestures is a way of speaking, isn't it? So I could dramatise those actions and therefore, in a way, give. Or, no, what I did really, though, was use the modern performer who is embodying those historical characters to some degree. And you could show her resisting. Yes, her defiance. Her defiance, her defying the way that the history constrains her. Yes, and also there's a debate, isn't there, about the film that they're making yeah. in the play and that she's starring in and the balance of that film and, and the content of it. And, of course, inevitably it gets steered towards featuring the story of Turner and the making of the painting as opposed to her character, who is one of the slaves. And it just made me think that if someone else had written this play, if a white man had written your play, I would have expected that Turner would have been the central figure in this play. Mm. It would have been more about his story and his painting. But it's important to say that Turner is not the central character in your play. I mean, he features, yeah. but he is in some way a peripheral pair, marginally caught up in the events and recording it. The range of black characters are the strongest presence in, throughout the play and carry the real emotional power of it. You talked about those uh, stories of resistance. There's a program just, in fact, very coincidentally aired last night on the BBC uh, called Enslavement. And in, in the course of that, you've just reminded me, they told a story of a ship that arrived in America. And as the slaves are being unloaded or they're getting off the ship, they have a sense that their futures are going to be horrible. They are no longer going to be free and they do not choose this life. And literally 145 of them chose to walk overboard and they're still chained so they're going to drown there's no way they can save themselves so they decided to choose that route rather than the future that they saw coming but it's the characters that you've created that carry this real individual emotional heft as well that there's individual stories and remind you that these were individual people i think there's such a temptation to just talk about the numbers and the and see it as a sort of global historical happening but what you've done in, in the characters of Thomas and his wife and his daughter, and then there's another character called Meg, who's an older woman who has been a slave, and their stories in themselves are horrific, but just seeing them and their being the key characters and their family life, their normal family life, their love, their aspirations, remind you that these are real people. I mean, this sounds so naive and simple, but it's very powerful that. Yeah. That was my intention. And I, I actually hope what comes through is that because, because there's so much about constructing things in the play, I hope that it's clear that this is my construction, you know, that I am doing that, that this is me attempting to retrieve that so that it's not necessarily an attempt to say, this is how they really were. This is a family that I can point to as having existed, you know, whose names are recorded somewhere, that they are conjured by my imagination. 
but given this sense that they are real. So it's important that you think that people understand that that's a construction of yours. I mean, you do have that sense, of course, because of the fact that the film's being made. So it raises the question of art and how does art portray these things? And they have that literal debate about the film in the play. So I guess, but so you're, you're happy for that to be sort of self-conscious so people understand that. Yes, I am. Yes, because I think that history is always told through us or mostly told through us. It's us reconstructing something and that we have some agenda in doing that. Yeah, so it's, it's, that's interesting when you think about, for example, your recreation of, an, of the historical character of Turner. So you have invented the family and the others, but Turner we know really existed. And so I'm, it's intriguing to think about the challenge actually bringing real life characters to life in drama and the attributes you give them and the interpretation you've given to Turner. How did you go about addressing that in terms of the reputation he has or how this was going to come out as your, port your portrait of Turner? I read a little bit about him. One of the things that was interesting was discovering his own link with the slave trade. And really, it was those were the sorts of things that I was interested in. And also, I couldn't find anything, any material on about really why he painted this and why he painted it in the way that he did. Although, of course, the, the, I found some work on his methods, uh, which were really interesting, you know, his techniques and things like that. So I'd read about what people think about the painting and I constructed Turner from different ideas about the painting actually. So it's not Turner so much as his attitude towards Thomas and his involvement, his collusion to some degree with the trade at some point in his life and the consequences of that for him psychologically. So he stands, doesn't he, in a way I kept thinking, well, he sort of stands as for the white establishment in some way or other. I mean, I know he's not really, he's a bit of a radical character himself, but yeah. being an older white man and, and in some way privileged compared to almost everyone else in the play, he still seems to stand for that. And he, he stands for it in a way because of his, there's ambiguity about his character that you've just described. So obviously we know as this creative genius of, as a painter, but he as a man is complex and morally ambiguous because you say in the play that he had investments at one stage in in a sugar work so that he was somehow complicit in the sustenance of the trade and yet on the other hand he was friends with some of the abolitionists and and i guess this painting may have been intended to be some sort of statement against slavery and then there's the moments as you say actually in the play where his moral action is questionable because there's a moment on the slave ship where he's there with thomas and thomas tries to intervene to prevent the slaves being captured as as we said when it, the ship stops in africa and turner well i mean he may have been duped into this but he basically does not help thomas and does not intervene he just lets it go on and it's the classic moment of leave me out of it it's got nothing to do with me the classic excuse of by standing by in the sideline you're somehow not culpable to a crime that's going on in front of you so that, again, seemed representative, I suppose, of the white man's perspective on this. Does that make sense? It does. I, I think I see or hear that quite a lot, uh, this idea that it isn't relevant to everybody, this history. So so that interests me, you know, or, or that people think, you know, when you think about identity politics and there are these contesting groups or <laughs> contesting for, you know, to be the most put upon or to have their suffering be equal to another group's, etc. And so all of that kind of thing really interested me and I wanted somehow to present those arguments and have the audience think about them. Well, you do because in both time frames, I think that goes on. There's a debate about that in the sense that, yeah. so there are two characters who are beggars in 1840, one of whom is black and one of whom is white, but makes up as black because he thinks he'll do better because of pity for the black man. And they have an argument debate between them about who suffers most because the white man claims that he's a, a downtrodden working class white person 
who's also not been privileged to the powers and wealth in society, so feels hard done by. Similarly, in the contemporary part of the play, there's an actor in the movie who's working class white actor who plays Turner, who claims that he's been disadvantaged in the industry because of his working class background and comparing that with the disadvantages that and the challenges that Lou, the uh, black actress, has faced. I really like presenting different points of view and arguments in plays and just kind of letting them battle it out and allowing the audience to follow them and to think them through and to be a little bit unnerved by them so that there isn't ever a sort of clear-cut answer. You know, I'm not saying I'm on this side or I'm on that side. I quite like that in a play because I think that it just gives the audience the responsibility (laughs) to think for themselves. And it's true, isn't it? The world is not as simple as that. Yeah. You remind me that in previous episodes, we've talked about Chekhov, for example, and how he doesn't present characters who he, uh, he presents them all as flawed human beings, rounded human beings. And there isn't a sort of political polemic going on ever in those sort of plays. And if you go that route, you're in danger of leaving some portion of the audience behind anyway. And there aren't very many issues in the world that are as, are black and white. So I, I, you're absolutely right about that instinct. I was thinking back to the point about retrieving the voices from the past. There's a, a character we haven't talked about yet called Ruben, who is a marine archaeologist who is advising the film on the history of the slave trade. And and he, to some degree, becomes a spokesperson uh, for these voices because he has done some of the historical research that you will have done. And also, literally, he's a marine archaeologist, so he has been digging up or they've been diving for wrecks of slave ships, for example. And I return to that program, which again happened to air last night, Enslavement, which talked about the uh, transportation and the ships going across the Atlantic from Africa. And I was amazed that they quoted these statistics. 12 million slaves were transported in total, but 2 million died en route. This is astounding number of lost souls and voices. Yeah. But the character of Reuben, it was, I found really interesting. There's some great scenes with him where he talks about those lost voices and also literally what's at the bottom of the sea. So there's a scene where he's with the actress Lou and he gives her a piece of steel ballast. Is that right? And what is what is the significance of that, Winsome? Well, the ballast, it's a complicated idea, but it was used to weight the ship down when people died and were thrown overboard to keep the balance of the ship. So if you discover a wreckage, one of the ways you can identify it as a slave ship is that it contains this ballast for that purpose. Wow, right. It's like in the in this program, again, there were certain types of steel rings that were currency, They're called manila, that if you find in the wreckage indicate that that was a slave ship because it was the currency they invented to pay for slaves in Africa. But it's even more poetic than that. The way you describe it in the play with Reuben is that the ballast represented the difference between a live and a dead body, Mm. that a dead body weighs less than a live one. So somehow to make up for the weight lost if the slaves die in the holds, they have the ballast and it actually weighs 21 grams, I think you said, and very poignantly, Lou says, is that the weight of the human soul? Yes, she does, yeah. I found that very affecting, that image and that idea. I wondered about the question about how you present the slave trade. We talked about it at the beginning about how Turner does it in maybe a slightly obtuse way, but there are lots of presentations which would demonstrate the horror of it very graphically. And I think Lou refers to this as, what is it, slave porn? That somehow we're to be forced to watch the horror. But there's an argument that that loses some of its potency by presenting the horror so explicitly. What was your take on that? Yeah, because there is a sort of, um, shall I say, pleasure? You know, there is a sort of pleasure in being terrified or horrified or disgusted or experiencing those extreme emotions, which 
allow you to escape from really engaging with what's going on instead of thinking through the significance of that suffering why it was inflicted etc you're lost in your own emotion and I just wanted to avoid that really and also I just didn't want an audience to experience that because when I was doing the research it was quite traumatizing and I didn't want the audience to leave with that as the thing that they were thinking about when they left the theater. I think that's right. There's a certain distancing also goes on, doesn't it? There's maybe you shut down in some way as well yeah. when you're presented with that. But there's also some question about how the treatment of the history has been appropriated by white perspective, isn't there? So we talked earlier about the voices of those that are unheard. And so that having been unheard, the whole story has been shaped and presented from a white perspective. And in a way, when you see that kind of violence, for example, you're in a sense just replicating the white power. Yeah. You're just watching yes. the subjugation all over again, and somehow that sustains it. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. The body of the enslaved person becomes dehumanized and is tortured over and over again repeatedly. And I did, yes, I did want to get away from that. Much in the way that, you know, we watch the death of black people on YouTube, you know. Yeah. You know, deaths in, as people are being taken into custody and stuff like that. And that, too, perpetuates this idea of voyeuristic indulgence in the sort of terror inflicted on that body. And I didn't want to do that. But it, it also perpetuates the assumptions of white superiority. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's sending a subliminal message that to be white means never having been a slave. Yes. And that the message is coming across is we're showing you this because now we don't do this. Aren't we good? We don't do this yeah. anymore. Yeah. When, of course, we clearly see that that isn't true either. Yeah. And it's it, it's pity rather than empathy, you know, rather than placing yourself in the position of that person. You're outside them. And exactly as you said, there is a, a superiority involved in, in doing that, I think. Yeah, maintaining that uh, power imbalance. I also thought what was fascinating is the way people debate in the play and the whole play itself is, again, trying to rebalance the story of the past. The white perspective is all about the abolition. And there's a sort of self-congratulatory sense to mm. that, isn't there? That somehow over even overshadows the culpability and the crime. I think that was very prevalent in 2007, where the celebrations of the abolition of the slave trade really focused on, yeah, on abolition of, I mean, it is about the abolition, but it, it's about those very well-known abolitionists. And there were Black people involved in that, and their story remains untold. Yeah, so it's, I, I read somewhere uh, an historian, I d happened to Google, and I came across a PhD thesis by a historian with a line that I really liked, which was, white historians constructed their own self-congratulatory narrative. During this period, Britain's commitment to the anti-slavery cause was often rolled out as a symbol of its moral progress and an in indicator of national superiority. Interesting. Which still seems to apply, which is not really the point, I would say. There was another quote, actually, in that same piece, which I was going to ask you about, because it brings it, again, more up to date, perhaps, which is the idea that freedom was not a normative state but was to be shaped according to the high ideals of Britons was, of course, the central paradox of the anti-slavery campaign. So this is this point that, again, still seems to perpetuate is that and you bring up to date, I think, to connect it to the Windrush mm -hmm. generation by Lou's, mm -hmm. the character of Lou's grandfather in the play. Could you tell us a little bit about where that came from and the part that Lou's grandfather plays in this play? Because he was of the Windrush yeah. generation, which I guess, I think your ancestry was. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I think we haven't talked about the ships in this play and the way that the ships kind of uh, shape shift. <laughs> you know, the glory it was a slaver, then wasn't a slave ship, then was a slave ship. And I was, because I was becoming fascinated with this whole idea of the ship itself as a character. And of course, I was interested in the Windrush and that journey from the Caribbean to Britain 
and it seemed to be a continuation of the other historical journeys. And that kind of fascinated me because that ship also sunk. <laughs> I did sank. I didn't write about it in the play and I really wanted to, that it, it sank and that that ship had also been used to transport Holocaust victims. So that it had this resonance there, this historical resonance. Again, you know, when the Windrush scandal broke, it was again an indication of this unresolved history. Who am I? Where do I belong? Am I British? Because those Windrush people considered themselves British and had been told that they were. And then when the law changed, they were no longer. They were displaced again. It's unbelievable that such a situation could occur, that we assume that everything's now sorted out in terms of like records and of course, the identities of the slaves we talked about earlier are lost, but there's no reason or way that the Rinrush generation should have been lost. And yet, there they were, lost in the same sense. They were. Their boarding cards completely disappeared. Papers gone. Yeah, no passports. Yeah. Uh, things don't change that yeah. much. The same things keep going on in different generations yeah. of history. But Lou's grandfather says, something along the lines of, he talks about his ancestors who were slaves and that even after they were freed and generations later, yeah. they still didn't feel the same. They were still not equal citizens. In fact, they could have been freed and continued to work on the plantation, but for a pittance and therefore not much better than a slave. And he talks about how generations later not being the same. He says, you know how many laws there are these days to ensure that black people are treated as equals? A real person would not need so many laws. White people think that we are like them. Like means not the same. Literally, like means not the same. The law says that we are not the same. They used to have the slave codes, and now they have equality guidelines. I, I found that a really potent point. The very existence of white-made laws enshrines difference. Absolutely. I've often thought this, you know, <laughs> that it means that, yes, you are considered, well, other, and that someone else determines what that means, how your relationship to the thing that isn't other, how close you are to it. Often people will assert that they're, you know, well, not often, but some people will say, oh, you just made that up. That wasn't to do with race, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know, you just got a chip on your shoulder or whatever. And actually, the existence of <laughs> these laws proves otherwise. It proves that we are not where we need to be. Absolutely. There's a really powerful scene that brings the past and the present together, where you literally bring the character of Meg, who I mentioned earlier, who has a terrible story. She was a slave who gave birth to a child, but she decides to, that she doesn't want the slave owner to have her child, so she tries to kill it and buries it, but it lives and the master actually cuts the child's tongue out. The master then brings Meg to England, but she runs away. But all of that's a backstory and, and tragic in itself, but there's a fascinating scene where she, from 1840, appears and talks to Lou, the actress, in 2007. They have a conversation. And Meg happens to be reading the newspaper. And uh, at 2007, you mentioned the celebrations of the, ab of the anniversary of the abolition. So she's reading a speech by Tony Blair, in which he's celebrating this bicentenary, and in which he says, we live in better times. And I guess, you know, in some ways they're better, but Meg asks Lou, from the, the voice from the past, asks the voice of the present, is it true? Has the world changed? Is it a better place? She poignantly says, tell me, is it true? Do you live in better times? Are you free? This just jumped out at me as a, such a succinct and powerful challenge to us about what has happened over that time period in history. How much progress has been made? Was that your intention? What did you want us to take from this play? I think Exactly that. I did want people to ask that question, to consider it, and also for us to think about how we 
view the past because in a way Meg is talking about her own situation and her own desire for freedom and I think that you know it's something we tend to, we may forget that she will have craved that that freedom but I but I also wanted that that scene is interesting to me because at some point Lou says to Meg I want to hear what you have to say, you know, speak, tell me. And so it's this historical character confronting the present and being given the opportunity to be heard by that person in in the present, to be heard and to be seen. It's a two-way dialogue. Yeah. You started off at the beginning talking about how Lou wants to know about the past, wants to hear the voices from the past as well, to understand herself and you know goes back to who do you think you are well we are who we were yeah and honoring the past that's why she's listening to meg you know that's why she's saying go ahead yes you can speak and i am here to witness what you have to say and i thought that was an important thing to do yes there's an, also in terms of language it's very interesting the way you because the character of meg speaks according to your stage directions in an african in her original african dialect she does literally in the play speak with an african accent so that we understand that she's speaking in a different tongue and we understand what she's saying but the point of that that is that she brings with her her cultural heritage which i think is important i think you've said somewhere that personally this is part of the point the disconnect with your own past is also to do with language yes yes the fact that it is, for me anyway, and many like me, lost, you know, a lost language. Not just language, but there are other cultural traditions about dance and music that are yeah. part of a culture that, you know, you were once part of in some way, but are disconnected from now. Exactly. I, I sometimes think about that because I write, you know, I make plays, and I often wonder, you know, if there is that in my ancestry, something like that, you know. That's fascinating. I was going to ask you about being in this industry. I can't pass up the opportunity to talk to you about what it means to be in the creative industries and the issue of diversity. Uh, it comes out, of course, because in the play itself, about the, the discussions about the film and about the fact that it's being directed by a black director. But at one point also, Lou talks about her challenges in personally in her career in the in the film industry she's very successful she's turning i thought quite amusingly stars in a mainstream american tv space franchise uh, that's made her a global star she talks about sitting at the rehearsal table and being the only person who looks like me sat around the table to read through i hear people say she's more successful than most she's made a bit of money what exactly is her problem haven't we given her enough the answer to that is no no, it isn't nearly enough. I wonder, is that an attitude you've experienced? Have you been singled out as a successful torchbearer for diversity? I don't know. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know about that. But I'm interested in the fact that, you know, you will get individual success stories. I guess I might be like that too. But then I'm very aware that 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 they are individual successes and that on the whole, the status quo remains. And that, you know, that's the truth of it, that it is very, very difficult for African people, people of African ancestry, to break through into these worlds in a meaningful way. Uh, there are so many uh, issues involved here. And you talked about as a writer, how challenging this is if you don't get exposed to models uh, or your world reflected in what you see in art, then how do you write about it? How do you become a writer if you don't see any models in the theater of the world that you know? So it, it seems to me that there's this whole circle of, of access that's a question about starting from when your children, of course, at school. And I think you said that you developed a passion for theater as a child when you were taken to yeah. the theater. And this is one of the things that I guess me so angry and I get upset about is the idea that our schools are not actually going out to the live theater, but also mm. even the breadth, the types of schools or the types of children are going to get exposed mm. to art. 
And, you know, that just starts the whole cycle off. It raises the questions about who's in charge of the theaters, who's choosing what we present, for what audiences. If all you're doing is giving the same stuff to the to the, your expected audience, then that's never going to change. But how do you open that up? And one of the other things, I, I noticed that there was a, a collective, the Black Theatre Collective was formed together. With, I don't know whether you're part of this winsome with actors and writers as a voice for change. And they identified a number of specific things. And one of those was about outreach programs in schools to encourage participation in theatre. Another was, and I think another one point I think you were alluding to in a way, is that hiring more of a diverse talent across all departments in the institutions. It's, it's not just the performers on the stage. It's every element in the theater, backstage and administration and everywhere, that if until that starts to happen, then it's then the worlds don't come together. That's right. And in this, theater is no different to any other industry. It just needs to undergo the change that is hopefully going to occur in most institutions in this country. Yeah. That's true. I wanted to take us towards the last scene of the play, the ending of the play, where you show Thomas working as a slave in Brazil. So he didn't necessarily drown. I'm not sure how literal to take this, but it doesn't really matter. And he's working under the guard of a, a white overseer. And he, to some degree, challenges the white overseer in a, in a fascinating way, I thought. Uh, and he talks about him being a survivor and he associates himself with other survivors over history, black survivors over history. And he lists a number of famous black victims. Ya Asentawa, Yvonne Ruddock, David Oluwali, Sam Sharp, Kelso Cochran, Stephen Lawrence. I'm ashamed to say that I don't know who all those people are. Can you tell us a bit about some of those names and why you raised those and Thomas's voice at the end there? Yeah, they're particularly potent for me. Uh, for example, Kelso Cochrane was killed in 1959, I believe, when there was an incredible violence visited on Caribbean people who came, migrated from various areas of the Caribbean. And I have this sense that, you know, this idea that the dead are forgotten just as the enslaved ancestors were forgotten and that there is a sort of a link between those there's a sort of lineage of these particular victims so i i somehow wanted to evoke that i wanted well i wanted thomas to evoke that and in keeping with this idea of collapsing time in the play i felt that he like meg was reaching into the future I read somewhere about the representation of history in art and there was this very interesting idea that the best way to do it authentically is to actually imagine that an atrocity is happening today rather than trying to reconstruct it. But then again, of course, it is happening today in these specific cases. There is a reference to Grenfell in there. And when, when you saw that tower burning and you discovered that there were a lot of black people who were the victims of this fire, I mean, you couldn't help but create the link, especially because I was doing the research at the time. You couldn't help thinking, oh, no, this is another sort of massacre. You know, the resonance is there, the, the repetition of this kind of neglect, a, a kind of willful neglect in this case. Yeah, you, you, you know, this, oh, and this continuing, this legacy of continued disadvantage and discrimination that started way back then. Yes, and violence as well, of course. Some of the people you mentioned were killed by either other white young people or police or... And there's a sense, therefore, also, though, there's a sense of survival, That's right. continuity in survival, yeah. and therefore, ultimately, some way defiance or determination in this survival that you get from the unity over time of these survivors. So you mentioned Grenfell. I, I've just found the, the speech that Thomas says, that he says to the white guard, who looks fearful because Thomas is 
started to not obey. He's looking like he may rebel and the, and the white guards getting a little fearful. And then Thomas says, I'm not surprised by your fear of me because I've survived. As a black man, no matter what you've done over centuries, I have survived. He says that he has survived the Zong massacre and the fires at New Cross and Grenville and death in custody. And then these names he chants and the rest of the cast chants these other names of those who didn't survive, but somehow become emblematic overall. Uh, we will survive. We will get past this. So it sounds like it's sort of a call to arms or not, maybe not that, but a statement of defiance and determination. Well, a statement of defiance and resistance. But, you know, uh, there is another historian, Orlando Patterson, who made a statement that really struck me. He said, one of the things that people forget about the history of enslavement is that the people who endured it never lost their humanity. They actually kept intact the spirit of humanity and the idea that life is precious, even though they had had this awful violence inflicted upon them. Yes, because the same may, might not be said of their conquerors or killers. So there is some power in that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we've reached the end of our time, Winsome. Um, there's one other thing that have, is a tradition of our podcast, is that I like to ask uh, my expert guest to recommend another play that we could talk about in a future episode. So I wonder if there's a personal favorite that you'd be happy to nominate. Well, I really love, a couple of years ago, a Rinzi Kenny's Misty, if you haven't already spoken of that. No, I haven't. And I remember I didn't get to see it, but I will look it up. It got great reviews, I remember. Yeah. Thank you so much, Winsome, for joining me today and, and for your wonderful play. I hope very much hope that we will get to see it soon. Thank you very much, yeah. As the curtain falls on the images we have seen of slaves chained together in the bowels of a ship or the ship in the throes of a storm or of bodies being thrown overboard to their death or of hopeful immigrants descending from the wind rush or of black performers on a stage. Tell me, how do we answer Meg's question? Is it true? Do we live in better times? Are we free? Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thanks for listening. To listen to other episodes, to find out news about future episodes, or to leave comments about what you've heard, please visit us at www.theplaypodcast.com. Dot com. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at The Play Pod. You're also welcome to email plays at theplaypodcast.com to suggest plays that we could talk about in future episodes. You can also register your suggestion on the website. Thanks again and see you next time.